Today on the cutting board is Gerber Principle Fixed Blade. What excited me the most about this knife, it's made entirely in the US, including sheath and packaging. The system includes many features and is marketed as Scout, EDC, and Bushcrafter knife. Unfortunately, some of the features are not that great. Beneath all this multitude of components, Gerber hid a very interesting Easter egg. There are also a couple of serious flaws that I discovered. Fortunately, all of them are fixable. So if you already own or planning to buy this knife, stick around. As I was getting acquainted with this knife, it gained some chips on the blade and lost its tip. There's also some damage to the rubber grips. While I'm a proponent of having rubberized grips, especially for the beginner knife owners, this is what they look like after a couple of days of pretty heavy use. Frankly, I was not too gentle on this knife and done some things that I shouldn't have. But when I peel a layer of rubber off, what was revealed was a set of beautifully formed, heavy-duty plastic scales. The designers at Gerber even managed to integrate this heavy-duty bolted-down look that you often see on the Jeep fenders, only to hide it under a layer of cheap-looking rubber. Everything happens for a reason, and while I was peeling the rubber off, I discovered a major design flaw. Watch what happened. The setup is very basic, just a heat gun, coffee pot, the setting is on the lowest airflow and temperature, an apple, not the phone, an actual apple, it serves as a vise to hold the knife. And here we go. It took almost no time to heat the rubber enough that it started peeling off. As you can see, I'm using my bare fingers to peel the rubber off. Which brings me to the first major design flaw that I discovered. It is a medical fact that human skin can suffer burns at temperatures between 125 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet nothing is happening to my fingers and thumbs. Please observe how easily this rubber is peeling off the handle at a temperature that is similar to the temperature inside your parked car on a hot summer day. Imagine if your dashboard peeled off at this temperature. In fact, the knife is about 60 degrees cooler than this cup of coffee. So, let's take a sip of coffee and consider. Since I did not burn my fingers while peeling the rubber off, the temperature of the knife never reached above 140 Fahrenheit. Military standard 1472G, human factor engineering standards, states that a closed vehicle parked in sunlight at ambient temperatures of 95 degrees can reach internal temperatures 125 degrees to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you left this knife inside your vehicle on a hot summer day and then had to use it, the rubber would peel right off. Which brings me to the next major concern. Low-grade elastomers, such as this rubber clearly is, perform poorly in flammability. So I decided to conduct a little experiment. All equipment used by United States military is required to meet flammability standards. So I will compare flammability of this mil-spec paracord to that of the rubber that just came off the knife. I observed that it takes three to four seconds to form a flame. Then it self-extinguishes in two to three seconds. This is not the case with the coating that came off of the knife's handle. It ignites immediately and then continues to burn at a fast rate. It generates a lot of heat. And look at it burn. In fact, to extinguish it, I have to blow on it pretty hard. Ouch. And here's side-by-side -side comparison with a paracord. Bottom line, I would not have chosen this knife if I knew in advance about the quality or lack thereof of its rubber grips. But if you already own a Gerber principle, fear not. Removing coating is easy and leaves you with a functional knife. As for me, next I'm going to try to figure out why the edge chipped and the tip broke off. The absolute essence of a knife is the balance between edge geometry and steel hardness. Since Buck Knives perfected this balance, I'm going to use one of their knives for comparison. The angle on the buck is 20 degrees per side or 40 degrees total. Measuring Gerber, I get 12.5 to the side or 25 degrees of roll, which is a pretty acute or thin grind. Typically, a thin grind like that necessitates either using a super steel or heat treating the steel to a lower hardness to allow for more toughness. Using a Japanese hardness tester file set, I determined that the hardness of both blades is right around 60 Rockville. 
Buck Knives is basically the gold standard of 420C heat treatment and edge geometry. So if they use this combination of 60 Rockwell and 40 degrees grind, then a thinner grind at the same hardness would definitely be a prime suspect for chipping of the blade. A natural conclusion is that if I change the Gerber's geometry, it will perform better. Rather than adding a secondary bevel, I change the geometry of the edge to convex. It ends up being pleasing to an eye and it does not intervene with the overall style of the knife. I am pleased with the result. It is the first time I have ever tried convex grind. Now that the two major issues have been addressed, I'm gonna go nitpicking. The system is known for making noise and difficulty of extraction, which can be negative or positive, depends on what it is you're doing with the knife. First thing I notice after assembling the system is how much of an offset from the belt it has. It's pretty thick. This style will offer you better accessibility with open carrying, especially for reinsertion, but it reduces concealability of the knife. I'm wearing inch and a half heavy duty belt and my waist size is 32 inches. First up is the vertical belt kit. Pretty straightforward, goes on easily and it's pretty well retained on the belt. Because the blade is short, I don't foresee any difficulties sitting down with a knife on my hip. The system rattles horrendously. And in case you're wondering, the doggy behind me is alive. She's just tired. Time to switch to Scout Carry configuration, which in outdoorsman lingo means horizontally on the belt and usually near the small of your back. Switching the hardware was a breeze. You have to keep in mind that if you're right-handed, the blade will have to be in the edge up configuration. First, I test the appendix carry. And now that it's on the belt, let's pull the shirt over to check out the concealment. Because of how wide the offset from the belt is, concealment sucks in the appendix position. Let's try positioning the knife in the small of my back. Pushing off with the thumb is not practical in this orientation, so I resort to brute force to extract the knife. Reinsertion seems dangerous, so I abandoned the idea. Hip carry is the only practical configuration. Even in this configuration, the extraction is neither fast nor easy and will require some training. A proper thumb push is required to extract the blade. And to do that, it's necessary to contort your wrist. After trying it on, I conclude that this sheet system is a gimmick. Adding this Mexican-made leather sheath that cost me $8 increases the cost to about $75 US for the entire system. And it looks better. There are several knives on the market of the similar size and price range, starting with this Buck 102. And if you're looking for American-made, reasonably priced knife, this Baron Sun Tuck 3 will fit the bill. This SOG seal pop has similar configuration. It is made in Taiwan. This is it for my review. The only thing left to do is some chopping and cutting on American walnut branch. This branch is solid and dry and potentially will become a decent knife handle one day. How about some stabbing and chiseling to test the tip? No issues were revealed during quick examination of this edge. A little whittling next. I push hard with my thumb. The wood is very hard. It is no accident that American walnut is a material of choice for gun stocks. Cutting paper is the next test. Pardon my technique here. All right, here we go. A bit of cardboard cutting. Not a problem. This knife is done. To see what I'm working on next, please subscribe. Well, I do have a comeback. Uh, I stroked the knife a little bit. After cutting all that wood, it needed it. So I'm stroping it on my homemade strope. And uh, here's the result.
cardboard. I love this hobby. Another comeback, I had some coffee now and I got some ideas. Just to be fair, I'm gonna burn these, my some of my favorite knives to see if they'll ignite just as well as that Gerber rubber. No flame, just discoloration. That's a uh, Benchmade bushcraft. Oh no, it's a $270 knife. But it's in the name of science. Okay, this uh, is Benchmade Buko. And uh, the silicone rubber did catch on flame, but self-extinguished very quickly. And this is a SOG. I'm not sure what it is. Some kind of hard plastic. This doesn't catch fire at all. It just bubbles. Maybe Gerber added this flammable rubber padding so that you have kindling to start a fire in a pinch. Ooh, is this sarcasm? With all these different materials out there, why did they choose this crap? I bought this knife because it was made in the USA. The principle, the principle is a US made fixed blade. Uh, we went to a couple bushcraft schools to get our, you know, the top level of the consumer insight. And it's a great product, except for the handle material, edge geometry that doesn't match the blade's toughness or hardness. Oh, and the rattling sheath. Other than that, it's a great knife. So will this knife, born in the top bushcrafter schools, save you in a pinch, say when you're trying to get out of bamboo jungle? Yes, but you have to wear a tactical boonie hat. Bring your prescription eyeglasses. And equip yourself with a tactical heavy-duty leather harness. In case you encounter a lion. On a serious note, thank you Gerber for bringing another product line back to United States. This is a good principle.